Nebraska and NOFA New Jersey for hooking us up, getting us all squared away. Um, we are focused tonight on our last farmer uh, farm tour and hopefully roundtable discussion afterwards uh, focused on Alec and the Ironbound Farm. So I think my, uh, my th uh, yes, Amanda, go ahead. How many people did we have signed up? Uh, just over 50, or, or around, around um, yeah, just over 50. So we're a little, little short. Yeah, so let's, um, let's give everyone like another five minutes, Mike. Johan is on the call. Um, and um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Johan has been, uh, oh, there he is. Oh, what an excellent sweater. <laughs> I've never seen you in a sweater. Like, wow. Now I'm all frazzled. We're going to need maybe five more minutes. Nikki, so I'm a little, I'm a little taken with, uh, yeah. I'm just yeah. picturing him there with a cat on his lap or some weird thing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but uh, it's it's good that Johan is on the call because um, he has also been a, a sort of instrumental uh, member of the team that that has has gotten us to where we have gotten in terms of earthwork and and thinking about water and and um, you know soil uh, retention and 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 sort of movement of of our whole kind of uh, layout. So if there's questions later about um, how Johan's work in terms of helping us construct our berms and swales and our ponds and, and the water flow on the whole property. It's, it's really great that he's on. And I think um, it's just neat for me, Alec and Johan to be together because it, it really is sort of indicative of the kind of collaboration that it takes to, to think about um, sort of regenerative organic farming in the most holistic sense and what's happening in the soil and you know on the surface and above all of that. In, in some integrated way, it, it's great that he's on the call. So I don't know if that's of interest for you guys, but I wanted to make sure he was noted and could jump in when you guys want. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I'll jump in there too, because I'd like to recognize uh, on that same uh, bent, I'd like to recognize Caro from NOFA Mass. Caro's been the lead person on this grant that has brought us together tonight. Um, so likewise, any kind of questions about conservation, um, you know, tillage and the conservation innovation grant, um, you know, we're, we're pleased to have Carol with us to be able to address that stuff too. Hey everybody. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm also just going to drop a link to a survey into the chat. Um, so if you are a farmer who's interested in this topic, you you are here, so you probably are. We're collecting um, some feedback and thoughts from the um, farming community across the Northeast about um, healthy soils, policies, and programs that would help them. So just a little plug for that survey. I'll be dropping that into the chat right now. Thank you, Kara. Nice That's... to be here. Thanks for hosting. I'm so excited to see you all. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun to get together. And uh, that leads to another thing that the whole chat angle, we'd love to have everybody that's here um, share, you know, their name and their farm name. Uh, I always ask this at the at the monthly meetings. Uh, so just feel free to uh, put a shout out for your farm, uh, where you're from in New Jersey in the chat. It's always fun to see and a good way to get your word out there and um, see other people. And Nagisa, I'm, I'm also happy to start because a, a little background, sort of what got us to the farm may not be necessarily relevant to everyone on the call, but I think it's important to sort of yeah. add a little light to how we got here. So I'm happy to start because if, if people come in, you yeah, know, yeah. during that intro, it's not so, they're not missing anything about the topic of the night, I guess. Okay, that sounds great. Does I that make sense? Yes. Go, go ahead. So let's okay, great. Right in. Great. So, um, Hi, I know the screen says I'm Alec, but I'm Charles, so hi. Um, I go by many names, but uh, tonight I'm Charles. So anyway, uh, so I don't, uh, I know a lot of you on the call, but for those who don't know, um, I, I have kind of a, a weird background. I come out of the political space primarily, and um, a little over 10 years ago, I uh, started a business in Newark uh, focused on urban renewal, workforce development, primarily in terms in, in doing environmental sort of cleanup and, and urban ag um, 
in Newark um, and and started primarily with a focus on if I was going to help rekindle the Newark economy, I would need to do so in, in partnership with the kind of most underserved members of, of, of that community, which are primarily the formerly incarcerated. And so uh, when I started the company, 100% of my employees were returning citizens, um, uh, people who had spent a great deal of time in prison. And uh, when I started, I, I thought kind of maybe the secret sauce was to provide living wages to these men and women, but I, I came to learn that that was actually really just the very beginning, um, that uh, people were coming out of prison as, as these returning citizens with, with really no sort of addressing of conflict resolution, uh, uh, you know, addiction, mental illness, family reorientation, a, a lot of things that we all maybe take for granted. And so I started to develop a curriculum uh, uh, with Columbia University uh, to to create a, a, a sort of a workforce model that we would integrate into our work um, in terms of helping in terms identity value and emotional intelligence and uh, jumping sort of ahead a little bit and then I'll, I'll come back to sort of why it's relevant but as I started my work and I'd been doing a lot of work in regenerative thinking not tied necessarily to agriculture, but more in terms of agri um, architecture and land use. And I worked with Regenesis and working on the Willow School and, and different projects like that. And, um, but was really thinking about, you know, re regenerative uh, concepts at a more theoretical and human level and thinking about repair of the human in, in, in that way and community. Um, and I'll come back to sort of how that focused our, our farming. But um, in short, when we were in Newark for about two years, uh, doing a lot of this urban ag stuff and uh, came to learn that one of the first, some say the very first industry in Newark was hard cider. Uh, uh, legend has it that George Washington only drank Newark cider, which apparently really pissed off uh, Thomas Jefferson because he was all about Virginia. But uh, we had the what was known as the champagne of ciders. And uh, and Newark cider was so famous that it was known as the champagne of ciders. And in awesome Jersey fashion, it actually used to be relabeled as champagne and sold as such. And, and as much as 50% of the champagne drunk between New York and Philadelphia for over 100 years was actually just cider from Jersey. So uh, we can wear that badge proudly that we have been Jersey forever. Um, same We've been up to the same shit since the very since before the country. Uh, but anyway, to be a cidery in New Jersey, we needed to have a winery license, and to have a winery license, we needed to be uh, fermenting, producing our cider at our site of fruit cultivation. Um, and and prior to coming to the farm, I had spent uh, a few years uh, locating the heritage varietals that were thought to be extinct that made Newark cider, uh, primarily the Harrison apple, a very, very famous apple of, in the day. Um, and, and as I said, was thought to be extinct. And I worked with a number of apple historians and even a guy who holds himself out as an apple detective, a guy named John Bunker. I don't know if any of you guys know him, but uh, we located the, the Harrison apple at a orchard in Virginia at a guy named Tom Burford's farm. And, I, and I, as I was bringing these apples back up and put them in our nurseries, we had close to 10,000 trees to put in the ground before we even had uh, a farm. And um, so we found our current location in Hunterdon County. Uh, there's a 108 acre farm here, um, a little less than an hour outside of the city. And um, basically, um, when we bought the farm, it was dead of winter. It was under two and a half feet of snow. We didn't do any soil testing. We didn't do anything. You know, it was just kind of fingers crossed that that it was going to work out. And and bought the farm. Um, it, it ends up that this property was uh, a winery in the 80s, um, started by the guy who invented the nozzle on the aerosol can. Um, what what nobody told me when I started was that you needed fucking nozzle money to do this stuff but uh so that would have been helpful but anyway uh so this guy who invented the nozzle and had a winery in the 80s got in a huge fight with his winemaker in the late 90s and the winemaker was really so upset that he ended up poisoning all of the grapes with roundup and um just destroyed 60 plus acres of grapes and uh and this guy, I guess, was just really so rich that he just simply walked away and the land laid fallow for almost 20 years before we bought the farm. 
So when we came upon it, you know, it was, you couldn't even see the grape trellises because it was just under massive amounts of, of autumn olive and just other crazy invasive species. And, and it took us um, months just to simply cut through the, the olive to, to pull the wires from the trellises to even um, be able to, you know, clean the brush away because we, we had to do it by hand um which was kind of funny because at that point it was uh me and 15 uh gang members from newark uh clearing land uh in let's say less than liberal territory out here in western jersey so uh yeah people weren't quite sure what had been a you know came to town but uh we were we were welcomed shortly thereafter but anyway so we cleared the land and i had uh you know, we were consulting with guys like Michael Phillips. I don't know if you guys know him, uh, a very famous, renowned organic orchardist and Steve Wood, uh, a really important uh, grower in, in New Hampshire and, and others, um, John Kemp and, and a lot of people. And um, at one point we were all kind of standing at the top of the hill. And one of these guys said to me, well, you know, when you plant, when you heal the soil and, 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 you know, plant your trees in, in two years, you're going to have a really beautiful orchard. I said, no, I'm, I'm planting the trees in, in six weeks. We, we got to get these trees in the ground. They said, well, you just can't do it. You haven't done anything. You haven't done soil restoration. I'm like, we can do that all once we just got to get these trees in the ground and we'll, we'll work around it. And, and so this guy, Steve said, well, you know, look, Charles, I, I love everything about your project. I, I love what you're taking on and I, I respect it tremendously. So please take this with the intent uh, that it's, that it's meant you need to stop approaching this like the aggressive New York Jew you are and slow the fuck down. And I was like, no, 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 but my guys need work. And I got to get these. He said, no, you can't make your trees grow any faster. And um, obviously I did not listen. And um, so for three years, so we had 10,000 trees in the ground. And for three years, we were really trying to chat with all the different invasive species, everything from mugwort to thistle to everything else. And there was big debates on, you know, do we, you know, how do we handle, do we worry about the weeds? And, 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 but the trees were really anemic uh, for almost three years. And um, so at that time, this is when we started working with guys like Johan and others. And uh, um, we sort of collectively had to come to a decision at that moment. It was, do we shift away from our sort of principles around regenerative ag? Um, or do we, you know, and, and, and start using, conventional herbicides and pesticides um, and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, bomb uh, our orchards and start clean and, and save the trees? Or, you know, do we stick to what, we're, what we care about? And um, I decided, as, as scary as this was in as many years as we lost out of the project, um, decided to rip the trees out of the ground and start again. Um, and um, it was, it was an outrageously painful decision um, to do that. And, um, but I was saying before, when I was talking about sort of trying to think about human repair in the abstract, um, by those three plus years on the farm, what I had really come to understand was that the principles in regenerative organic agriculture, which most of you all know is about how do you create a healthy ecosystem in the soil? How do you create um, a system of diverse organisms, um, and the more integrated those di those diverse organisms are, the, the more resiliency there is in the whole system, right? So as each organism in the system gets stronger, the whole system gets stronger. And I and I not only firmly believe that in terms of, of, of farming, but I also believe that in human repair. I believe that in community development, right? That this idea of creating a system of di a diversity and an integrated diversity. Uh, Johan often talks about uh, integrated functionality. Um, how do you, you know, how do you create sort of functionality through the whole system through that integration? Um, and because we believed in it, whether it was with our workforce, whether it was with our partners, or whether it was how we were working the land, um, I felt pretty strongly that we couldn't abandon those principles. And it just didn't seem to me like you could start that process by just wiping out everything and killing everything with chemicals. It just didn't make sense. And, you know, throughout my time, I've been working with everyone from Rodale Institute to others. And Rodale, who's asked us to be a, a, a showcase farm for them and a partner for them, is because where I believe, and I've had this conversation with a number of you a lot, um, I believe that with the sort of um, 
commoditization of organics. Um, a lot of or a lot of the sort of essence of organics has been lost, right? So the the elements of social justice, right? Human repair, the value of the people actually working the land, um, animal welfare, um, even soil health. It's very easy to be an organic farmer and still use a lot of plastic and still use you know chemicals that just have an organic compound. Um, a huge number of organic farms on the West Coast are actually currently um, staffed by private prisons lending them inmates to farm their land because we don't allow in migrant workers enough anymore in the country. So we, some of our organic farms in this country have literally have slaves, right? Free prison labor uh, uh, working their farms. So to me, that doesn't really capture the notion, uh, the essence of what organics was about. And that's why we've sort of evolved our model into regenerative organics to talk about how do you heal the land by working the land? And how do you take into account all of the stakeholders? Uh, not, not just the food coming out of our land, but the land is a stakeholder, the workforce working at a stakeholder, our partners are, are all integrated and in stakeholders. So with that in mind, I, I really wanted to put together a team of people that knew stuff way better than I do. Um, and, and that includes Johan and, and Alec. And we spent a lot of time thinking about um, what did we learn out of the three years of having primarily like monoculture, you know, uh, talking a big regenerative organic game, but really having an orchard of 10,000 trees is just, just sort of monoculture, regardless of what we were talking about in terms of the understory and stuff. So I'm going to let after the video, I'm going to let Alec and, and Johan spend time talking about uh, the transformation from that point. But, you know, so I want to really not go jump to ahead, but just to know that at a 30,000 foot view, coming from a farm that was struggling, uh, you know, our, our trees, as I said, were sort of anemic. And I think we could have fought our way through to eventually have them have apples, but they always would have been struggling to now, um, uh, how many years later? I don't know, four or five years later, have, having had two years of cover cropping, having had Johan uh, redo the earthwork and having a whole system of berms and swales, putting in um, acres of pollinator strips. So now not only do we have native pollinators like bees and butterflies, but we also have hummingbirds. Um, how did we integrate um, our produce operation, which Alec really came here to head up, but how did we fully integrate the produce and the livestock and the orchards in together? So it wasn't just a farm that had those things on it, but how did those things sort of interconnect? And, um, and so I think that's what these guys and Alec really it will spend most of the time talking about, which is how did that interconnectedness lead to such more nutrient dense food? How did it create sort of such balance in the soil? I mean, how did it create resiliency when we're thinking about our, just even our orchards on a 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 year outlook, how much more resilient is our farm to both, you know, weather the, the literal and, and figurative storms. Um, and so we've replanted under an entire new model. Our orchards are planted on contour with huge alleyways to allow our livestock. And, you know, we have the silvo pasture model with a really robust understory and alley cropping. And so I would say this is the first year um, where it has really started to feel like what a regenerative organic farm should feel like. And so the last thing I'll, I'll leave you guys with on that sort of opening point is um, as we all struggle to figure out, um, well, first of all, how do we figure out a local food system during something like this pandemic? I think we have a huge opportunity to work together uh, and to, to create, um, equity amongst all of us, where we can create viability for every farmer and value add producer and retailer and end consumer? How do we create this local food system um, modeled after regenerative organic agriculture? Because the, the roadmap's already there. Nature has already taught us how to do this. And I think by us taking this on and, and doing so um, boldly, and it's really scary right now to to not farm with the sole notion of like whatever your yield is, your annual yield. And so many farmers are, are forced to think about that annual crop for survival, which we understand here. We feel so rarely privileged 
um, to have the luxury to not just think about that annual crop, but think about how are we planning for the future and how do we at Ironbound become a model for other farmers? How do we show that there's viability, that there's resiliency, that there's sustainability in this approach to farming and not just, you know, um, being like a show pony. So, um, yeah, so I don't know, Alec, is there anything you wanted me to add in the upfront stuff or do you guys have any questions on that before we move to the video? And I, again, I was trying my hardest to keep it at a sort of 30,000 foot view so Alec could get into the, no pun intended, but get into the weeds of it. But uh, um, did anybody have any kind of questions at, from that intro piece? I don't know. Like it's question. totally a great question and uh, it's worth giving ourselves a second or two for people to unmute and if you have a question please feel free to put it out there and uh we're gonna go we're gonna open it all for discussion are we gonna lose you charles are you gonna be able to stick with us the whole way um well, I, I have, I'm going to try to get onto a link. I have an appointment that I have to go to, but I, I'd like to be back for the Q and A. So I'm going to do my best to get back, jump back on. So I was going to have Alex send me the link and I'll jump back on as, as soon as I can. Uh, to be under full disclosure, again, as I said, I'm a Canadian and I have to get my son at hockey because uh, farming is important, but it doesn't come anywhere close to Oscar's <laughs> hockey career. So that's my big, my big commitment is I've got to get him at hockey. So thank you for joining us. Yeah. And I, I do offer this up. I know. Um, Giza and I have talked about this before, but like at the at the conference and stuff, I'm I'm here, but I uh, always uh, for any kind of participation or anybody that ever wants to come and visit the farm, we are very much um, eager to have you all come. We hate that this tour was virtual, and um, I, I hope people use this just as sort of an opening, invite you know opening to a conversation and invitation to come and and spend time with us. And we're really available because I do think what we're working on here is is um, we hope it, it can end up becoming a model that that uh, other farmers can adopt. But but as I sort of alluded to, not just adopt sort of on their own, I, I think part of our collective success is gonna be in thinking about, you know, us as a collective, right? And um, I think NOFA is uh, uniquely positioned to create or to allow us to feel as, uh, part of a community and I think um, I think we're all and I think farmers often suffer from this um, much like other sectors in our economy but uh, you know we live in this sort of um, you know winner take all zero sum game us versus themness in, in every part of our lives and and um, I think our success as growers has to come down to this idea that um, you know, my success doesn't come at the expense of yours, but but our success is bound up with one another, right? And that my expense should be, my success should be connected to yours. So um, I, I hope we can all maybe start acting more like a community, uh, like we expect the organisms in our soil to do. So um, this is not just a sort of casual invitation. This is really us um, trying to welcome other growers into our, you know, our little crew here and and it's easy because we mostly drink a lot here so you're always <laughs> welcome to come and drink and um talk farming so yeah the other night we got johan and another visitor we were in the woods till 10 30 at night and uh yeah that's not usually how a farm tour ends but you know whatever that's where it took us so yeah um good so if you have other questions or does anybody have anything for the intro or do you want to move to the video mike i think we're probably ready to, ready to roll Good. Awesome. Right. Great. You Thank that. you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Charles. For okay. Cool. My name is Alex Giuseppe. I'm the farm manager and partner here at Ironbound Farm in Huntington County, New Jersey. Um, just to give you a background of what our farm consists of, we're a 108 acre property. Um, we're a diversified operation that has uh, 10 acres of dwarfed apple trees for cider production, 
We have 12 acres of annual vegetables. We have half an acre of covered low tunnels and high tunnels for year round production. We have a plethora of different types of birds that we graze in our silver pastured orchard that we just put in this past season. And uh, we do also a bunch of uh, perennial infusion berries and fruits to get also mixed into our cider. Um, on the farm, we have a tasting room. So we kind of have a restaurant that runs half of the week uh, seasonally. So a lot of the produce that we're producing is for that outlet directly on site and as well as making value added food products that we sell through our kitchen and through our on-site farm store. Uh, we have a hundred member CSA that we started on this property this year. Uh, we also sell to a farmer's market in Philadelphia and we work with a few large wholesale distributors in the New York area and also another wholesale delivery for restaurants in central New Jersey that services 150 restaurants in the tri-state area. Um, right behind us is our early spring field where we have beets, Swiss chard, kale, collards, all of our coal crops and some radishes and carrots. Um, this is one of our four fields that we plant in like a block row crop system. Um, as I mentioned before, we also have uh, 15 acres of silva pastured orchard uh, with apples in it and there our trees are planted on 30 foot centers so we can alley crop uh, annual crops between that like uh, sweet potatoes winter squash potatoes and melons and then we also have another section of that where we rotate um, meat birds through so we have about 600 broiler chickens that we do every year as well as 250 turkeys that we move through that system as well <laughs> So right now we're in our silver pastured orchard. So we have uh, about 30 different varieties of uh, cider apple trees, dessert apple trees, and crab apple trees that are 30 feet away from each other. In between, we move our meat birds and turkeys in between. Um, and that will be in rotation with alley cropping, annual crops, or some perennial crops in the future. So this is, one of our three mobile range coops that we constructed this past winter. Um, it's basically a 20 foot by 36 foot long gothic greenhouse built on skids that you can drag with a truck or a tractor forward each day. So um, we brooded them in this for about a month until it kind of warmed up a bit and we were able to move them and we just started moving them about two weeks ago. So every day we move them about a day. Um, now that it's nearly July, we're probably going to start moving them twice a day so we can maintain a there's adequate pasture for them to be eating and we're not depositing too much uh, nitrogen and fertilizer into the soil. Um, so you can see the succession of how the grass further away from us is a bit taller and uh, as we move closer to the coop uh, you can see where they were yesterday where they pretty much eaten everything and left a nice mat of uh, manure as a deposit on the soil. Also, one thing now that we're going through all of this, we're seeing that some of the pasture that we seeded last year is a bit patchy. So I think that we're actually gonna start broadcasting some more uh, seed for the pasture behind the chickens, just to make sure that we get adequate cover for the future. Um, so this is a mixture of more heritage-based, commercially bred chickens that we get from uh, Moyers Hatchery in Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm not really sure what the actual crosses are, but they're take about another 15 days to maturity. And they also have not a huge focus on the breast size. So a lot of the conventionally bred white chickens are more about the white meat. Um, being that all of these chickens are actually just gonna be turned into food that we're selling at our tasting room on the property. Um, our chefs here prefer the dark meat over the white meat, um, especially because one of our signature dishes we call a cider can chicken. So we take a whole chicken and then we put it on our mother fire, which is a giant outdoor fire-based cooking apparatus. And then we just take the whole chicken, stick it on a can of our hard cider, and then we just baste it with butter and an herb sachet. And it's absolutely delicious. And we found that the dark meat does much better with that sort of uh, cooking than uh, a chicken that is mostly white meat. This is our what we call our chef's terrace. Um, this is our main outdoor seating area for our tasting room. Um, so 
We have planted a mixture of culinary herbs, medicinals, flowers, and natives in this area, um, as well as a lot of our infusion fruits that we grow that gets mixed into the cider. So it's kind of been a really good showcase and talking point when we have events and workshops here because we can have our chefs be cooking over the fire with all the food that's being produced. We can have our cider maker out here making cocktails and then the guests can come and forage some herbs that they can then garnish on their food or in their cocktails. So it's been a really fun integrated experience that we've been able to create on our farm. Well, this is our mother fire on the farm. This is uh, where most of our food is prepared for a restaurant or tasting room rather. So um, this is where in the cavity of this giant grill is where we burn all of our wood. And then we take all of the coals and embers out and then we can move it to one side that's a grill. The other side is a plancha. And then we also have all these hooks and things that we could hang all of the vegetables from or meat. Um, then right here we have a giant pit and a spit that we can put whole animals on. Uh, beneath this metal flooring is uh, basically a giant oven. So we can actually do baked goods and pastries and bread and all that sort of stuff down there. So um, if you have any way to cook anything over open fire, uh, you can pretty much do it all here. So it's been a lot of fun. And for me being a chef before I got into farming, it's like my dream to be able to grow food in the morning and be a farmer and then put on a chef's coat in the evening and serve customers and really have a full farm to table experience on site, which has been really awesome. One of the cool things about the mother fire is how modular it is with what you could do depending on what you're cooking. So these are two little pizza ovens that we made. Um, this past weekend, uh, we, it was the first weekend we were allowed to open up and serve food again with COVID. Um, however, there's lots of restrictions of what we can do and how we can actually serve the food. So we limited our menu just to four different types of pizza that are all featuring our meat and vegetables that are produced on site. Um, so we do flatbreads and then we're doing like a few things of chicken and like just grilled vegetables that we're pulling off the farm right now um but yeah then these are like hooks that you can hang full pieces of meat from or we have baskets like this that you can pierce onions through it's just a lot of fun and um yeah cooking on fire is definitely the way to go and cooking on coals is even better <laughs> So we're in one of our uh, high tunnels that we have on the farm here where we do year round production. Um, one thing that we're really fortunate to have about this high tunnel is that it's completely climate controlled um, and we have heat in here. So in the winter time, we crank the thermostat to be just above freezing. So we can pretty much guarantee that it's never gonna go below 32 degrees, which allows us to have more success with some of the greens that we're planting in the winter time for an early spring harvest. Um, right now, uh, as you can see, there's tons of tomatoes and cucumbers in here. Um, so with this, we put down landscape fabric in between to help keep the soil warm and not have to deal with any um, weed issues that are coming up that we have to manage in the middle of the summer. Um, another reason that we put this down here is that being that we plant tomatoes frequently in here, when we're clearing out the crop in the end of the season, it makes it really easy to remove all of the prunings and the plant debris so we could get it out of the greenhouse if there happened to be any sort of disease issues. Um, so that's worked out really well for us. Um, in between the rows of fabric, we put straw mulch again around all of the tomatoes um, just to help insulate the soil a little bit better um, and underneath that there's about two runs of drip tape as well um, in this greenhouse specifically uh, we don't drive any tractors in here so we use a bcs for any sort of light uh, surface tillage or we use more market garden style tools like a broad fork the tilther and things like that. Um, so there's not really any sort of deep tillage that's happening out, happening in these structures at all. Um, this year what we're experimenting with the tomatoes is the whole lower and lean system as you can see. Um, we're getting to the point actually where this week is going to be the first lowering and leaning that we're going to do. Um, so what we've done in the past was a two liter system and then just by the end of the summer the plants are hitting the plastic and you need to use a ladder to every single time you're harvesting it's super labor intensive so when we're lowering and leaning we pretty much just take this hook off and then we'll actually lower the plant a little bit and loosen it 
about one or two turns and then we'll hook it back on and then slide it down in the direction that we determine that we're going to be going. And then we do that for every plant. Or this one, I'll just lower it once and then we just lower it and lean it. Because by the time the season's over, the plant gets to be about, I mean, dependent for the cherry tomatoes, sometimes even up to 20, 25 feet long. So where the plant was actually planted here, the top of it by the middle of September will be about 20 feet down in that direction. And then once we do this also, we don't want to have any of the leaves touching the ground. So we'll pretty much bottom all of the leaves and just leave a vine so we have nice airflow and circulation at the bottom of the plant. And it works out great with the cucumbers. I don't know if I would do it again next year because the, the cucumber plants have just been doing so well this year that the tendrils are keep connecting to the strings next to them and it just makes moving them a little bit more work. So I think that we're going to try using some Hordenova netting and just do a traditional trellis system um, next year in the high tunnel. You can see how compaction is a, a real thing. So like when we built this last fall, where the whole front of the tunnel was actually an old like farm lane, but we wanted to have a 150 foot long tunnel. So um, this whole front, we did the same prep, but you can see how much smaller and stunted the plants are up here. So here we're gonna have to really do a, a good broad forking or potentially like add some more topsoil. We're not really sure what we're gonna do to strategize having better productivity in the front of the tunnel. So as you can see right here, we're, I'm standing in uh, the ditch part of a swale. So uh, last year we put in uh, three giant swales across our entire property that are about 6,000 feet long. And there's three of them 225 feet spaced away from each other. So what this does is when we have a heavy rain event, um, it allows the water to hit this ditch and spread out um, across the soil profile and it sits for a short period of time and then repercolates into the soil um, across the whole soil horizon instead of just having it runoff that's going from the highest point to the lowest point as quick as possible. Um, right after we planted this we seeded it with a mixture of uh, warm season uh, native grasses, a bunch of different flowers for pollination like a rudbeckia, um, there's some milkweeds and then some more traditional cover crops like rye and oats and triticale and things like that that you can see here and um, we're not really going to mow this at all we're just kind of let it do its own thing and kind of um, just rehabitate itself into this environment All right. <laughs> um, uh, does anybody have any questions for Alec? Because um, we're gonna bring up the, the PowerPoint now so that he can talk a little bit more about his soil practices, but I thought maybe we should take a moment after the video and check in for questions. <laughs> Anyone? We're gonna start calling on you guys. <laughs> yeah, we got a quiet crowd. <laughs> oh, I'm sure everybody's making notes of their questions and waiting for uh, waiting for the question and answer period. Okay. Well, Amanda, over to you to pull up the slideshow. Alrighty. All right. Ready when you are, Alec. Okay, uh, you can go to the first slide. Okay, so I guess just first, um, the pictures that I sent Amanda to put in this presentation are um, mostly just all of the attachments and equipment that we use on the farm. Um, so the CIG grant that we've been working on is about reduced tillage practices. Um, so over the past two years, I've made some modifications, modifications and changes to the equipment that we have to um, try experimenting with things that we could do to um, reduce the amount of tillage that's going on. Um, a, one issue that I've come with moving to this property about a year and a half ago is um, there's tons of rocks. Um, 
so that's something that I haven't really experienced before in other properties that I've been farming on. So that's been a pretty big variable of trying to figure out um, what works and what doesn't. Um, I found that a lot of uh, implements that are like a draw bar style where you're pulling something um, instead of a PTO driven uh, piece of equipment uh, works much better because spinning steel and rocks just don't really get along very well. Um, so as we can go through all the pictures, I'll kind of go into a little bit more detail with, with that. So uh, what you guys are looking at right now is a Buckeye Tractor Company uh, bed shaper. Um, so this is uh, one of my most used and favorite attachments that we have, um, mainly because of how modular it is. Um, so you could use this for lots of different applications. Um, right now, it's set up in this picture um, for renovating a bed. So um, if you can see right behind the tire uh, in the picture on the left is uh, this almost like boot shaped uh, sweep. So basically what that does is you set that up in the tire centers and it uh, kind of acts almost like a middle buster and uh, loosens up any compaction that was caused from the tractor tire. And um, there's a shield on both sides. So from a bird's eye view, it's kind of like a V shape. And um, what that will do is as it's digging into the wheel track, it's going to move uh, soil to the left and to the right. Um, in this case, the shield that's moving towards the center of the tractor is uh, then going to get loosened up by that S tine shank that you see right behind it. And then on the very end of the attachment is basically a shaper pan um, that presses the soil to kind of create uh, I call them Kit Kat bars, but a really nice uh, uh, raised bed. Um, so one thing that I would say is really important about how our fields are set up is um, we, so we have uh, pretty much three different tractors that we're using for all of our field prep and cultivation. And um, for those of you that are tractor farmers you probably know this, but those of you that are not, but um, your centers on your tractor alignment is extremely important. And um, what centers are is the center from one tire to the next tire from left to right. And um, if you're planning on driving a piece of equipment over the field while there's plants growing in it, um, it's really important that all of your tractors have that same spacing. Um, because if not, then your tires are going to be running over the shoulders of your bed if it's a wider tractor. Um, so that gives you a lot more flexibility with what you're doing. So all of our tractors right now, when we do our primary tillage, um, transplanting, uh, cultivating, or even flipping a bed within a block um, is all done on, a track, on three different tractors that have the same centers. Um, so then you can drive right over the bed and tend to the crop. Um, I think we can go to the next picture. Uh, this is a video of this. And before you play that first, so um, in this image, you can see that um, right behind the side links are two discs. There are two foot discs that you could put on. And what this does is um, this is actually, we only use that when we're making a bed for the first time in the season. And uh, that helps really make a mound in the middle. And as you can see, there's no s tine shanks um, in those three center uh, bars on the frame. So what this does is you have to the left and the right of those discs is that same um, like plow shank that I just described in the previous image. And then now that disc is further taking the soil and moving it to the center and it's making a mound um, and then now you have this mound that's going to get pressed by the press pan on the back that you'll see in the, in the video. And then, um, so you can go play the video. So, um, sorry, I thought that you maybe would get more uh, shot of the actual bed being formed. Maybe there's another one. Um, so what this is what we would do for the first pass. Um, so with the CIG grant and just in general of trying to reduce the amount of primary tillage that we're doing in a season, 
Um, this was a really important implement for me to have because I could use it and run over the same bed um, without disturbing the plants that are to the left or the right. And um, by doing that, if I don't want to make that much uh, aggression to the soil, um, and I'm, if I'm planting a bed for the second time, these discs come off and then the s tine shanks go in the middle and it kind of acts like a, almost like a light chisel plow in a way that's going to just loosen any of the uh, like hard soil from the surface and then just reshape it into a really nice tight bed um, just in one or two passes. Um, a lot of our farm is sloped. Um, so to get the beds to be level, a lot of times you have to go back and forth and do two passes on a bed. Um, yep, next. Oh, here you go, here's another video. So yeah, that's just a video. I think that was where we planted our onions this year. Um, so that's pretty much what it looks like after you do a block. Um, and just to, with having the tractors and doing this more row crop style of farming, um, in these fields, we don't really have big um, aisles uh, or walkways. Um, well, some crops we leave intentionally very big walkways like tomatoes or peppers or eggplants that we're harvesting and hauling out large volumes of vegetables but for crops that are really harvesting the whole thing at once um, like in this case this field is onions um, so I sacrifice the luxury of having big uh, walkways and I can maximize the amount of actual bed space um, so all of our tractors are 67 and a half inches on center which give us roughly about a four foot bed top um, and our aisle, the tires on our tractors are between about nine and a half inches. Um, so when, with some of the shoulder kind of crumbling as time goes on, our, our aisles are really no more than a foot, um, probably closer to 10 inches on average. Uh, next. Okay, so uh, one of our cultivating tools um, that I've actually be, begin to use less and less for actually weeding because of the rocks that we have on the property is a basket weeder. Uh, so this is our International 274. It's an offset uh, cultivating tractor. Um, and for those of you that don't know, so if you look at the left picture, so a lot of old uh, vegetable tractors for cultivating were designed so then you could look um, between your feet from the operator's seat and look directly at the ground. Um, so you could drive over your crop and not uh, and be able to steer based off of the implement and not be uh, getting cultivator blight, which is uh, weeding out and killing your crops. Um, so being that this uh, implement is basically these hamster cages that just spin and crumble like the top quarter to half inch of the soil. Um, and in these cages, since the wires are so close to each other and for us with the amount of rocks we have, a lot of times the rocks get stuck and jammed and then it kind of drags and doesn't uh, spin freely across the soil surface. Um, so actually this year I didn't really use it that much for cultivating, but what I ended up using it for um, was to not have to do a primary or a secondary tillage on a bed that I was replanting. Uh, so um, I experimented with using that to kind of level and make out my seed bed for we planted all of our fall carrots um, that was planted in the same beds that we had all of our um, spring coal crops, our cauliflower, broccoli, and um, cabbage. So uh, after uh, flail mowing it, I scalped the soil and then just did a few passes back and forth over each bed with the basket weeder. And um, I was able to get um, about maybe half of an inch or a quarter inch of good tilth um, to run a Jang cedar on. And uh, while doing that, uh, as you can see, there's four baskets on each tractor. Um, so I have there are, the centers in between each basket, I think is 14 and a half inches. Um, so I was able to draw a line basically to push a Jang cedar. So then I could have parallel rows for cultivating the character sweeps on later on in the fall. Next. Uh, here's a video of me doing that. 
Oh, sorry, a picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so as you can see, I think I, yeah, I did two passes. So you could see the lines that are kind of drawn out. Um, so then you have a reference point for when you're pushing a cedar across the bed top. Next. Okay, so this was um, my newest uh, cult to be, well, actually I had this implement, but a smaller version. And then I traded it in with another farmer and got a larger one this season um, based off of our silo pasture plantings. Um, so on the farm, we have kind of two zones of silo pasture orchard. Um, that is all again modular. So what's in what spot each year could be constantly rotating. So pretty much 50% of that is spaced out. So then we could be running uh, chickens and turkeys or maybe small ruminants in the future, as you saw in um, the video we watched before. And uh, the other 50% of that is annual crops that are row cropped in between. Um, and in those row crop zones, we're doing large crops like potatoes and sweet potatoes and winter squash, watermelons and other melons. Um, so being that uh, it makes the most sense when you're planting out an orchard to have really long rows and you don't wanna have a bunch of blocks that are only 100 feet long or 150 feet long. Um, so it made sense to have, so most of our rows are anywhere between 400 to 800 feet long. Um, so we'll, we'll um, plant, so the trees are 30 feet on center from each other. And then if you're moving to the left or the right, uh, there's about a two and a half foot collar to the left or the right. That's kind of the tree plant zone. And then, then as you move closer to the, the center, you have an eight foot aisle that's a permanent uh, pasture, this little strip that's grass that we mow or could run animals through a narrow lane if we wanted to. And then that leaves us with 12 feet in the middle um, which gives us two um, uh, beds that are 48 feet, uh, 48 inches uh, bed top. So um, this tool is important specifically for potatoes and um, the winter squash and things that we're doing in a two row system, kind of like a traditional row cropping method. So um, what this machine does is it weeds, uh, it, it helps, you can use it to create mounds when you're mounting or hilling your potatoes. There's little like spiked discs that you can put in the front to, um, to help make a hill. And um, it cleans up the aisles really well. And uh, on each little gang, uh, if you could kind of see, there's a little yellow wheel in the center and there's an adjuster that, it, it's basically a gauge wheel that you can adjust. Um, and what that does is it uh, helps you pick out the uh, the intensity of the cultivating that you need to that you need to do. Um, so it's wider. So we actually have two other gangs that we could put on. So we could do four rows at once. So for potatoes or winter squash, for instance, in between one uh, alley of the tree rows, there will be four mounds of winter squash or four mounds of potatoes that's the same specs as if it was two beds. Um, and everything across the farm is universal as far as like how big a bed is, how big the centers are, how big the centers of a row on a bed is, whether it's two rows or three rows. So every single piece of equipment that we have can pretty much drive over any bed or any crop that we have at any time. Uh, next. So this is a BCS. So as I mentioned before, uh, um, all of our high tunnels and low tunnels are managed with uh, pan tools and BCS attachments. Um, so we had uh, wheel spacers put on this. So similar uh, style uh, to what the, cult, the larger tractors are is you want the ability to be able to drive over the aisles with the wheels and the BCS and not be um, driving over uh, the actual bed and adding to compaction. Um, so on our farm, we kind of have two different, uh, as far as annuals go, we have two different like departments of how we're cult uh, growing crops. So we have a market garden um, that's about like an acre to two acres of this style of farming. Um, and that includes our high tunnels and low tunnels. 
And there we're doing more of our niche, uh, like salad crops and roots with greens on them and scallions and baby fennel and uh, that sort of stuff where it's just a more intensive high value crop. Um, then, then in the field with the tractors, we're doing big like half acre plantings of beets or carrots or radishes or turnips or two acres of potatoes at a time or two acres of winter squash and so on. Um, so having the different tools for each department has been um, really important for us to execute and maximize the output from each given space. Uh, next. Uh, yeah, so here's the high tunnel. This is the same tunnel that you guys saw in the video where we had tomatoes. So this picture I think was taken probably in the middle of September when we ripped all the tomatoes out. Um, so for the field prep here, uh, we just broad forked and didn't even use the tiller actually on the BCS when we put in our winter greens in there a few weeks ago. Uh, so we just broad forked the whole thing and then we used the tilther um, which I unfortunately don't have a picture of, but um, it's uh, Johnny's market garden tool where it's the it's basically a tiny tiller that has only about inch and a half uh, tines on it. And it's actually powered by a drill, uh, like a, a battery powered drill. Uh, actually, there might be no, sorry, there's no video on here. Um, so, yep. And then for the winter time, the way that we plant our high tunnels is um, we call it like a Pac-Man style planting. Um, so we don't actually build any beds. Um, we plant the entire tunnel edge to edge. Um, it's 30 feet wide and there's 28 rows, uh, single rows of crop that we put in. And uh, the one foot in between each plant is essentially the aisle um, as we need to go through to do any sort of hand weeding or harvesting. And then as the crops are mature and ready to harvest, we just harvest the whole crop at once. Um, and we just basically like, like Mrs. Pac-Man just eat our way from one side to the other. Uh, next. Uh, so this was our, one of the tunnels. This was our late winter, early spring planting uh, last year. Um, so we had, a really late planting of kale and collards because it took us until the middle of winter to get this tunnel up. And then um, as we uh, were moving into spring, I think in late February, uh, we just intercropped uh, arugula and mustard in between the kale. Um, so just to, so we could get a quick cutting of that stuff before the kale and collards is ready to harvest. Um, and then that got actually harvested very, with the, a lot of the kale and collards actually this season bolted quite quickly, um, but we sold kale florets and collard florets, then ripped that out. And then we did another planting of radishes followed, following that. And then this was our eggplant and pepper and uh, zucchini tunnel uh, this past summer. Uh, next. Oh, wait, actually don't, before you go. So um, just to note, so this is another one of our high tunnels. So this one is all manually automated. So the other tunnel uh, is fully climate controlled. There's heat and exhaust and shutters and all that sort of stuff. Uh, this one, you can't really see from this picture, but there's a ridge vent on the top. Um, and then the end walls, there's no small door. So the entire wall rolls up and down. And this tunnel is actually three feet taller. So we could drive a tractor in here if we wanted to. And uh, the left side and the right side both roll up all the way. Um, so when we built this out, if you can see on the right side, uh, we put, I think uh, it was like two feet of polycarb uh, across the whole uh, length of the tunnel. Um, that way, when it's really cold in the middle of the winter and it can be windy, but it's no clouds in the sky, which means it can be 75, 80 degrees in there. And we need to vent the tunnel to have good airflow. Um, we don't want cold uh, air to be on the crops, especially if crops are just germinating. So by building this little uh, retaining wall around the whole thing uh, helps prevent uh, cold air from hitting tender leaves in the middle of the winter time. Uh, and the ridge vent, you can roll up also to vent the peak of the tunnel. Uh, next. Um, 
So this is uh, our primary uh, tillage implement. It's a spader. Um, so I guess there's, we have two tools that we use for primary tillage. Um, the first one that um, there might be a picture later on is a yeoman's plow. Uh, that's basically a subsoil plow. Um, and with that uh, frame, it's uh, again, I'm really into having modular equipment so you could do more things with it. Um, so on that, we have four uh, shanks that uh, extend to be about 32 inches deep. And um, they're spaced about 15 inches apart from each other. And uh, all of our, our entire farm is laid out on contour. So we run um, all of our, we run the yeoman's plow across uh, all of the beds. And what the subsoiler is doing, it's, it's piercing um, through the topsoil and into the subsoil, but it's not mixing that. And what it's doing is it's creating a very thin slice um, through the soil uh, where when we have water, uh, groundwater runoff, um, it will catch these little channels and set deep and percolate into the subsoil. And um, what that also does is it creates a cavity for air and uh, roots to penetrate deep into the subsoil. And uh, we're not mixing the topsoil and the subsoil. So a lot of deep tillage, what it's doing is it's mis mixing all of um, that material together. Uh, what we actually want to happen is to have the plant roots go down into the subsoil and they're going to be bringing up all of those locked up nutrients into the topsoil where all of the microflora is to start digesting that into a, um, a plant available form. Um, so after the subsoil, uh, subsoil, we run the yeoman's plow. Um, so this is a conservation tillage tool um, that's out of the Netherlands. Um, so there's two uh, moving parts on this that move extremely, extremely slow. Um, so in the front part of this are these giant spades. And um, they're actually, it's essentially a plow, like a moldboard plow, but instead of inverting the soil left to right, it's lifting up giant chunks of soil and then it's throwing it up against the top shield of the implement. And by that throwing action and, and hitting the, the steel is allowing these giant clumps to break at their natural breaking point, wherever there's spaces between all the different aggregation. And um, so it, it literally just breaks where it wants to break. There's no force breakage. Um, and that's allowed to happen as you drive this implement at point, <laughs> 0.2 miles per hour. Very, very, very slow. Um, and then this drum on the right side that you see is a harrow. And there's all these um, spring-loaded teeth that are on it. And they spin backwards as you're moving. So what that does actually is any rocks or debris pushes uh, that down just about an inch below the surface. And in that action, it's just crumbling the top layer of the soil. So you have a good seed bed to plant right into. Um, so instead of like a, a regular tiller where it's just pulverizing and turning the soil into sand, this is just aerating and leaving gigantic chunks that are anywhere between eight to 15 inches um, below the soil. And it's just crumbling about the top half to one inch, uh, which is all you really need to transplant into or to direct seed into. Next. Uh, this is our uh, root harvester or potato harvester. Um, it's also been a really great tool for helping sift rocks out of the field. Um, but yeah, so this basically these giant um, silver teeth in the front just oscillate back and forth and cut the soil. And then it's an essentially a vibrating conveyor belt and um, it sifts all of the soil. Then you, you're left with your potatoes or your beets or your carrots, uh, any real root crop. Um, this implement works really well with. Uh, for things that have vines like sweet potatoes, uh, you can see this round thing on the left. There's one on the other side. You just flip those upside down and the, that uh, coulter uh, cuts any vines and, or any de plant debris there might be. So then you don't get bound up on um, the edges of the machine and everything flows uh, through uh, the implement. Uh, next. And this is, uh, you can play it. Oh. 
So this is a uh, implement that we've been borrowing, and renting from uh, uh, Atrusa out in Pennsylvania. So in the springtime, we uh, had to. Some of our fields were so rocky we couldn't even plant into. So uh, at we would uh, actually I wouldn't even see that. We just use a perfecta, which is like a secondary tillage tool to just loosen the soil and run this through and this basically pushes all of the rocks into a hedgerow and then you uh, put a rock bucket on a skid steer and you just come through and remove the rocks directly from the field. Um, I think I put this in here though because uh, in the spring I experimented with just using this as a tillage tool um, because it really does a great job leveling and um, it just is really softening again the top surface of the soil so you get good seed contact. Um, so I planted right into this with our uh, transplanter in the springtime uh, without even forming a bed. Um, so we, we just had a, a block and then knowing that instead of not needing to make a raised bed because with all of the passes with the tractor, um, with the transplanter or fertilizing or cultivating, uh, the weight of the tractor on the centers is going to actually make an, a slight indentation. So by the end of the season, you're, you're getting about a three or four inch raised bed anyways. Um, so that was a pretty fun experiment and um, they had pretty good results. Um, so yeah, uh, next. Uh, this is one of our transplanting tools. Um, so we have a water wheel transplanter and this is a mechanical transplanter. Um, since I've moved to this property, I've used this less this season um, just because of the rocks that we have. Um, but uh, essentially what this does is you load all these little carousel hoppers in the left picture that you see with your trays. Uh, they slide in so they're sideways. And then this, uh, these black, there's six uh, shoots on each seat and you pull the plug right out of your tray and then you drop it in the chute and then the machine plants the plants for you. So you don't even have to really touch the soil. And uh, when it's dialed in and running well, you could plant, uh, we use this for beets a lot and things that are uh, really close spacing. So you could do a hundred feet with three rows, five and a half inch spacing in about maybe five minutes. Uh, if you have really good people that are fast sitting on on this in the seats, um, actually the, the biggest bottleneck with this machine is that it doesn't hold enough trays. You can only fit 20 on it. Um, so maybe a winter project will build some more racks on it for next year. Um, but yeah, otherwise a really great implement. And this was the the transplant that we used uh, into the field where um, we used the rock windrower. Um, as our field prep that we just saw in the previous video. Uh, next. Uh, this is just a field. This is our spring, our first spring planting. So um, this is the field with the rock picker that you just saw. Um, so the left, that's like nine beds of beets that we transplanted with that implement. And then there's a few rows of kale and college looks like right in the front. And then to the right side is all of our spring coal crops that are on two rows. So that's cauliflower, broccoli, and cabbage. And um, again, all while even though some of these have three rows and some have two, uh, the left row and the right row in each bed are in the exact same spacing from the centers of the wheels. Um, so you could drive through this entire field with the same tractor, no problem. Uh, next. Uh, that's our high crop tractor. That is our main uh, vegetable tractor. Um, so with this, they're called mutters. They're more popular out on the West Coast, uh, but probably for if you're doing that 10 plus acres of vegetables, I couldn't really imagine doing it without a tractor like this um, because of its versatility of being so high off the ground. So uh, from the bottom of the tire to the underbelly of the tractor is 34 inches. Um, so but I can cultivate our peppers and eggplants uh, when they're already flowering and fruiting right before we stake them um, so, like several times um, and just drive over the crop uh, with no problem. 
Um, also, it has a creeper gear, which is if you've ever ran a transplanter, um, the slower you can go, the better. Uh, this can run our spader that needs to go very slow as well. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a great tractor. Um, I could talk for hours about it. Uh, next. Uh, this was uh, the field that um, earlier, a few pictures back where I showed the basket weeder field prep. Um, so this was our fall carrot field. Well, I guess still it is, the carrots are still out there. Um, so the left picture shows all of the lines that the basket weeder marked out um, without, again, using uh, any primary tillage tool and then just running the jang. Um, then you can see uh, the carrots a few weeks after seeding. Um, I will say though, after having to cultivate that with the tractor uh, two or three times, um, I'm definitely probably going to purchase a rear mounted um, seeder for next year um, because having the rows, the sorry, the, the seeder drop seeds exactly where the center of the wheel is. Um, is a bit tricky, especially with all the rocks that are in the field. So there is some sway and uh, we're definitely cultivating out some of the uh, crop that we're seeding. Um, next. Uh, that is the section right next to it. That looks like, sorry, the picture's blurry. I think that's all of our fall um, winter radishes and turnips. Uh, those were all, uh, actually, it's, no, that might be the beets. Uh, it's beets, which would be uh, transplanted. Um, we always transplant beets. I've just had really good luck with that. Um, and then to the right would be all of our winter radishes and turnips that uh, we did with the same uh, method as the carrots that we just looked at. Uh, next. Uh, just closer up on the beets. Oh, I think that I was put this in here to show. So we didn't make any raised beds, as I mentioned before. So in the right picture, you could just see from one or two passes with the tractor, uh, the indentation of a, of a raised bed uh, just happened naturally. Next. And yep, same thing. That's our, that was our full, well, still is, that's uh, our fall our Thanksgiving broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage field. Um, yeah, I think I just put that in there to show the indentation of the, the beds again, since we didn't uh, lift the beds up and we just planted right into it. Next. Yep, just another picture showing that with Finn, my dog for scale. <laughs> uh, next. Uh, oh, so this, I think I just put in there. So this is, uh, in a low tunnel and, um, we, uh, for a lot of the summer crops, we put landscape fabric down, um, just makes weeding, not something you have to deal with since it's all, all of the tunnels we plant, uh, closer spacing than we would in the field, uh, just to maximize the footprint. And, um, as anyone knows, when it's July and August, the least amount of weeding that you need to do, the better. And uh, we use uh, landscape fabric that we can use uh, for several seasons. Um, just not a fan of black plastic mulch and spending money on something I put into a dumpster uh, a couple months later. Um, so yep, next. And that's it. That's Thank a great so assortment. Much, Thank you. Alec, uh, something that jumped out at me right away when you were talking about the specialty crops you had around the dining area. Yes. It made me think about um, the complexity of managing specialized tasks. And I was wondering whether you have a, whether you have special crews for different tasks or is it just one can you talk a little bit about your crew and yes um, and so, how you manage that? so we could talk about it two ways we could talk about the reality of 2020 <laughs> with uh not a big enough crew and letting a lot of things slip 
um, or we can talk about what the plan is for the future. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, basically, yeah, there's lots of departments on the farm. Um, so I guess one, we have an orchard, we have uh, a very quickly expanding livestock program. Uh, and then we have uh, row crop style vegetable production. And then we have market garden and season extension style market gardening. Um, and then we also have some infusions and then this whole area that you just mentioned, like around the chef's terrace of the herbs and all that sort of stuff. Um, so for moving forward, um, the way that we're setting up and looking at what labor is going to look like for next year is that where there will be one um, lead manager in uh, almost each department that's kind of owning that space and working with me as the overall farm manager to come up with a plan and a budget for that area and labor needs and all that sort of stuff. And then, uh, so those are all, there's seven full-time year round farmers on the property. And then March to September, October, uh, we're looking to bring in uh, six or seven uh, seasonal apprentices or assistant managers. Um, they'll be working within each department. Um, and the idea with, and then one of our full-time managers that's year round is like our crew chief. Uh, so actually there's two of them. So we have James, that's our crew chief. And then Sean that we gave the title of um, like a field uh, assistant production manager. So the two of them are kind of this roving management team that moves across all of the departments and are stewarding all of the seasonal laborers. Um, so the crew chief is kind of the guy that's uh, making sure that everyone's doing everything the right way and just kind of being the team leader. Um, so that's James, who's a very amazing people person that loves working with people. Sean on the other end is like the hardest worker I've ever met in my entire life that every time I look away, he's already at the end of the bed ahead of me um, and very shy and doesn't like working with like leading people that much. So to put them together is like a perfect marriage. And uh, Sean is very competent with uh, tractor farming and running all the equipment and attachments and maintenance and all that organizational set. So um so yeah, so we'll have the two of them kind of moving the crew through the entire farm as needed. Um, all of that is being organized through. Uh, we're starting to use this new app to organize the whole farm. Uh, well, I don't know how new it is. It's new for us. It's called When I Work. Um, it's actually uh, an application that a lot of restaurants use just to make their work schedule for when... Um, like when do I work or I'm sick and someone fill in my shift. But uh, one really cool feature with the pro version of this app is that um, you can schedule and put documents into a shift. So if we have, I'm, I'm scheduling our harvest crew, um, I can input the entire harvest list with our harvest manager into that time slot and anyone that is scheduled to work on the harvest crew is open up their phone and then look at what the harvest list is. Um, and then you can also have uh, logs and like uh, time clock things in there. So as far as monitoring how long the irrigation is on, um, so we could use that through this app. So I'm, I'm hoping, and again, I haven't used it yet. I'm just learning the program now and setting it up for next year. But I think it's gonna be a really amazing interface for people organization. Um, since in the next come March, there's going to be 13, 14, 15 people that are on the farm every day. And, uh, as anyone that's managed a crew before knows had the people, the, the, the people part of the farming is always the hardest part. So, um, I'm hoping that this will help, uh, organize and, and, uh, steer the crew in the right direction. So everyone's on the same page. Alec, can I add some, can I add one thing to that? Yeah, sure. Go to the next question, Mike. Um, so everyone's story. Yeah, this is Charles again. Um, sort of two things I wanted to add. Um, first, on, on the people side. So as when I started the conversation and I talked about sort of part of our mission and, and understanding about our obligations to the community with which we serve, um, it's a key goal of ours to make sure we can have not only as much full-time staff as possible, 
but make sure that that full-time staff has, you know, 100% of their health care paid for, housing, um, you know, living wage, et cetera. And so when we're employing, um, you know, primarily for, uh, you know, the chronically underemployed, that it for us includes the formerly incarcerated, veterans, um, et cetera, um, a lot of these men and women, um, we, we, we have to sort of be building sort of a system around them to allow them to flourish the way that Alec is talking about with James, uh, who comes out of that community. And so it makes the task even harder when we're looking at employment or, or people with specific skill sets, because we're also trying to, you know, build a robust, uh, you know, community maybe of people that aren't necessarily experienced farmers, um, but also, again, trying as best as we can to move away from just seasonal workforce and full-time labor um, as much as we can with also being financially viable. And, um, and that brings me to the second point that I wanted to add, because you were asking about specific crops, Mike, and also specific, um, uh, you know, skills for those crops. Um, one thing Alec and I are talking about on a continual basis, and something that's obviously even more acutely relevant because of the pandemic, but is, you know, where, what does small scale farming or mid sized farming in New Jersey look like when we're competing either in the commodity space on the wholesale side or the, you know, lack of, let's say, financial security at a farmer's market on the retail side? So, in addition to thinking about labor and crops and, and, you know, how to best farm, we're also thinking about how to create sort of viability within each of those departments. So if we see something like our laying birds uh, being far more lucrative on the wholesale market than our meat birds, it allows us to think about scaling up, you know, those laying hens and, and keeping our meat birds for our tasting room activity and, you know, our more intimate uh, food setting. So it's a very layered question you're asking in terms of thinking about labor, areas of expertise and viability as a mid-size, you know, family farm in New Jersey. Yeah, because yeah, this because is such a unique situation, Charles, could you talk a little bit about that as, uh, you know, as uh, capitalizing the farm and overseeing all this activity? Uh, is there, do you anticipate sort of an extra investment that you have to make to make that work? You know, I mean, um, the, the short answer is up to this point, absolutely. And, uh, you know, as the old joke goes, um, how do you make a small fortune farming? You start with a large one. Um, uh, I think, you know, for us, having spent almost 10 years, um, no pun intended, but organically kind of figuring out what it is that we do for a living as a company, um, it, it, we've, we've spent a tremendous premium on the kind of workforce we're talking about and, and making those determinations. Um, uh, but that investment, I think, led us to um, coming up with, I think, I think this is the first year we really saw sort of, um, we've laid the right foundation. And I think moving forward, we see now, and Alec was alluding to this about those departments, I think we have a much clearer sense of how to create um, sort of economic success quicker now having laid that foundation and so we're hopeful that the investment we've made up to this point um, doesn't need to be made by all the other farmers on this call um, but that's something they can learn from us and and this is where big conversations again with Johan come in like how do we create collective thinking around things like chickens how do we create you know group growing models um, where we can share costs on feed and um, and processing and things like that. So um, up to this point, we've been outrageously financially um, unsuccessful. We have had a lot of trial and error and um, sort of epic levels of error, but that's what has allowed us to learn. And I think out of those errors have, have come a, a new way of thinking about what the farm looks like moving forward. Um, 
So even, it sounds funny, I mean, I know Alec sort of obsessively kept talking about the rocks on our farm, but it's not a funny thing. Uh, I mean, it's funny for us, it's, it's fucking, you know, whatever. But, uh, but, um, but, you know, knowing how to sort of work specific land without sort of forcing your will on that land, um, knowing how to listen to the land and, and sort of um, kind of allowing the nature to guide us into what we should be doing there um, has been a really important um, learning curve for us. And I, I've been really excited to even the shift when Alec alluded to the fact that we're planting on contour. I mean, our orchards um, don't look like any other orchard in North America where we're not planting east, west, north, south as a traditional planting or high density planting on trellises. But this idea of a silvo pasture where the where the trees are sort of allowing for the understory to be planted, Alec alluded to the infusions and everything growing under them, the alley cropping beside of them and the livestock and the like the meat uh, houses that you saw. Um, so, you know, all of that has been a, a sort of ongoing experiment. But I think right now, if you came and look, looked at it as a snapshot, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, here's how you can grow produce. And here is a market for that produce. And then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the one thing I'll add to it, and I, I'm sorry for labored answer but the other thing I realize is this is something I'm very focused on um, when whether you're talking about in the value add space like us on our hard cider and and uh, you know the other beverages that we make or you're talking about a farmer um, fighting for shelf space for a farmer is incredibly difficult if you're fighting against a large-scale commodity farm or you're fighting against you know for us with our hard ciders again you know, Anheuser-Busch, um, very, very difficult to fight those shelf wars because of the commoditization of food. So a lot of what we're thinking about in addition to how to grow the food is how to create um, different revenue streams for those farmers. How do we have those farmers participate in the value add? How do we get those value add products and their, and their um, produce and meats onto, you know, shared shelf space where we're not fighting for shelves, but we're, we're actually, you know, owning them together so our little farm becomes a model for that where our tasting room using all of the things that we're growing but also what we're selling in our market is not only our own produce but other other farms produce and meats and also the value add products coming out of all of those so i think for us we're trying to look at it as holistically as possible from the growing to the actual shelf and where does the farmer fit into that you know whole ecosystem I, I want to switch gears switch here, gear uh, real quick. We've got a question from Jared about uh, on-farm processing. Yeah. Thanks, um, yeah. So I was wondering. Um, Nigisa mentioned you guys um, have broilers, and uh, Charles just mentioned that as well. And I was wondering if you guys process on site and how you do that, and what regulations. And yep. hoops to get through because we're doing broilers on our spot, uh, but we're in Bergen County. Um, and I've heard some really mixed messages from a lot of people about what's allowed, especially with wastewater management, um, composting of the blood, bones, yep. and unsellable parts. Cool. So, yeah, so you can um, slaughter any poultry or fowl on site um, legally without needing any sort of inspected space if you have a trailer. So the key word is a, a trailer and the, the term is a, a MSU, a mobile slaughtering unit. Okay. Um, so we eventually, as we ramp up birds in the future, are probably going to build our own. But for now, we've been working with uh, Matt Wilkinson that has Hard Cider Homestead down in Ringo's. And uh, he has um, um, a, a 16 foot uh, unit that you can rent for $250 for the day and uh, you drive it up to your farm you can set it up we reverse it right up next to our mobile range coops and then we have someone that's catching birds putting them in, in bird bins or cages whatever they're called and then just move them 10 feet away and then we're slaughtering them right out in the field oh, what um, gray water and waste management post process um for like what do we do with the kill water and everything 
Yeah. So, you know, obviously you have to spray out your kill cones, you have to spray out your defeather, mm-hmm. your scalder, all that yeah. stuff. So, so as I've never come across any regulations that I've read or what he has shared with us, but we just drove the trailer over to our parking lot and then power washed the whole thing and sanitized it. And it kind of just daylighted um, into the drains that go into our septic system. Okay. Um, Cause we have some like a uh, parking lot grates or like uh, just, sewer grates that are in the asphalt on our parking lot and you um, most of the blood feathers yeah. but for yeah. all since we did it right out in the field so like any of the blood or the water or the feathers um i actually just collected the feathers and tossed them and mulched them around the apple trees and or yeah. in the pasture right out in the field um and uh when we did our first batch uh it took three days to go through 500 chickens so every day we moved the trailer with the coop every morning forward. Um, so we were kind of uh, spreading all that out across the pasture as we were going through the process. Um, and as far as my understanding goes, is that legally you're allowed to process a thousand birds in a year if you're selling only in New Jersey. And then, but you can legally do 10,000 birds a year in New Jersey. And the only other stipulation is that if you're selling across state lines, there's an additional um, code that you have to have put on your labels. Um, so that's the, that's what I found from the FDA and the USDA's website. And um, we've actually heard, we've actually heard that that number we know a number of other farms in New Jersey that have actually increased that number to 20,000. They're saying yeah. anything. Yeah, actually 20, it is 20,000. Yeah. yeah, you don't need to be a USDA certified. You yeah, know, so as my understanding where there are three levels, Alec, you referred to the first mm-hmm. and the second, but there mm-hmm. is a third as well. But my okay. understanding was that once per year, at least my experience was this in North Carolina, once per year, you had to have a USDA inspector come by to look at your unit. Obviously, I'm assuming yep. the guy you're renting this from has yes. that. Yes. Yep. Don't. And yeah, that's can- something. So uh, I actually just had uh, our FISMA audit uh, with Clint two weeks ago. And uh, we talked in depth about what that whole pro- procedure is going to look like uh, when we do build our own. And yeah, that it needs to be, you, you basically just need to have a plan as to everything that you're doing. So you can save the blood and the feathers and all that, and you can compost it, but you need to have records of how you're composting it and what temperatures and logs, or you can drop, put it in a black garbage bag and put it in a dumpster. It, 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 he made it seem like it didn't necessarily matter. Well, obviously you can't be like mixing it with water and then fertilizing your lettuce with it the next day, but you just need to have really good record keeping for when you do have an audit of that unit as to what's going on. Um, but being that we don't own one yet, and Matt Wilkinson has his inspected annually, um, for right now, that wasn't something that we had to worry about. But Matt did make it clear to us that his his inspection um, sort of acted as a blanket right. for us. So that, yes. that and, but, and by the way, as a related, uh, somewhat as a related but um, extended conversation, um, I've, I've been I've been working uh, very closely with um, Senator Booker's office this year. Um, and, and Senator Booker just actually last month put a bill on the floor of the Senate um, where we're working at getting um, a state capacity to certify um, slaughterhouses in New Jersey. Uh, so kind of pull that away from the USDA and allow us to have a slaughterhouse for all livestock, Not obviously not just poultry, but we're talking about um, livestock. Uh, and uh, so that's moving forward very well. So I'm hopeful that in in the near future, um, we're going to be able to have um, spaces throughout the state where this can be happening off site. Are you saying, um, for are you the, saying non-USD non-USD facility? Because I know John McConaughey is double the John's 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 is is only allows for slaughtering of his own animals. Right. So John John is only one of two USDA certified on-farm slaughterhouses in the country. Um, uh, They don't even have their own animals anymore, but that's a whole other conversation. No, what we're talking about is actually pulling the authority away from the USDA to some degree and and, uh, 
it's funny that I have a non-drinking vegan senator as my key advocate in this. So uh, not that Corey uh, consumes much of our products, but um, uh, but um, yeah, we're actually talking about allowing the states to be the regulating body for that, not the USDA. So it would come under, you know, set, Secretary Fisher's, you know, offices in the Department of Ag here in New Jersey. Um, and so it, it really becomes another tier below USDA. It will still have limitations on volume, but it will not be like John's where it's just his, his animals. Understood. And, Understood. and thank, you thank you for your efforts in that realm, yeah. Carl. That's great. Well, right now we're sat, you know, we have to drive a pig three hours away and when yeah. it comes back yeah, probably isn't it. my pig. So, but, um, but yeah. You know. As it currently stands, and solely for poultry because that is really the only exemption under 20,000 produced on your own farm as long as the processing facility is on a floor with wheels yes that's the exception that's it that's it and by the way for anybody that wants to know the trick weirdly and sadly that's also the same trick for food service um as long as you have a food truck connected to a commissary off-site you can serve you know a hundred thousand people at your farm uh without um you know without worrying about uh you know dep septic rules so it's the exact same thing yeah that is there, the exception as long there, as it's, on wheels, think, it's a mobile trailer yeah i think there's some additional exemptions so um this Carversville Food Foundation, right over the river from us, um, they have an indoor uh, poultry slaughter facility that's inside. Um, I think that they had to go through some loopholes to make that legal. Um, so they have installed, uh, geez, I think, it, literally a 10,000 gallon uh, cistern uh, in the ground that captures all of the post slaughter sludge. And it has turbines in it that literally aerate and digest and compost all of that into fertilizer. And then they have a management plan where all of their kill waste is being fertilized back into their pasture. Um, so Steve Tomlinson was able to work out around having an indoor facility that's not on wheels to do that. And um, from my understanding, that was mainly because they were able to put in the infrastructure that captures all, like all of their floor drains and sinks in that building all get channeled directly to this cistern um, that's composting or fermenting all of the waste um, for fertilizer. So I, I think that it was literally a semantical thing where they were just calling it fertilizer instead of waste. Um, so they're actually making manufacturing fertilizer for their pastures through the process of killing chickens <laughs> but again again just to just to restate this because i'm trying to plan out my own processing facility on site and it gets expensive fast mm -hmm. um you put it on wheels you don't have to call your health inspector nope you have to call yeah. the usda and let them know you're going to have a mobile processing facility under your ownership and that you'll be using it mm -hmm. correct yeah these laws are so dumb. Welcome to New Jersey. Oh, dude, dude, welcome to Jersey. Yeah. You guys, let's, um, anybody else out there got uh, right. some questions Thanks, about guys. poultry? Um, I'm sure the poultry, the moving the coops. Any questions coming up for anybody? Um, you mentioned fertilizer a couple times. Alec, could you talk a little bit about your um, fertility decisions, uh, practices, like yep. what, what you use, how you apply it, how you choose what to use? Yep. Um, so kind of just as a rule of thumb, um, I apply uh, mushroom compost from Kennett Square um, on an annual basis. Um, so every field gets... Um, anywhere between like really, I don't know, like half an inch to an inch of that um, in the springtime. Um, depending on what the soil test says, uh, we'll put down limestone, calcitic or dolomitic. Um, and then, so that's kind of like the primary in spring field prep. Uh, we'll also sometimes amend where our summer crops are going to be um, some trace minerals. So we'll put down azomite 
a lot of the time um or uh cro- like a mix uh from for trail um that again is based off of what the soil tests are so i love logan labs um i joined like 10 years ago to the bionutrient food association with dan kittrich and you're a life member and you get like the extra bonus pack of your soil test at logan labs that give you like the full spectrum um so that's i do a fall and spring soil test every year from them and then i'll send that uh they do some analysis for you um i've gotten somewhat decent at understanding that stuff myself um and then so that's kind of like field prep uh we'll also spread for some heavy feeders uh organic uh composted pelleted chicken manure um and then that's pretty much the main dry applications. Um, when we're transplanting, we make um, worm casting tea and I add AgriPro to that, which is a uh, biological like a uh, liquid humate uh, as a stimulant. Um, and then we have some other seaweed, ocean fish based amendments from um, uh, ADA. Uh, that uh so like um kelp and seaweed and all that sort of stuff so i'll add that to a tank that we're soaking um before we transplant if it's a hand transplant um or i make a mixture and add that into our trans all of our transplanters have tanks um so we'll do a, a big uh drench as we're planting out into the field um in the high tunnels and some crops that we're spraying surround on like winter squash or if we're spraying BT on some of our coal crops to deal with cabbage bugs. Um, I generally, instead of just adding water to that, I just always add some other good stuff from the ocean to help amend and foliar spray as well. Um, and then the tomatoes and the high tunnel, um, we always do a foliar application um, about every 10 to 14 days. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I got. Um, Mike, can I ask a question? Please do. Yeah. Anybody feel free to, to shout out. And if you can't get through, just send me a chat and I'll be sure you get your question in. Go ahead, Steph. Um, Alec, I'd like to know about pests and diseases on your apples and whether having them involved in such a complex ecosystem that it deters uh, the normal uh, onset of pests and diseases. Um, so Charles might be better to jump in on this because he's been here since the beginning. So I don't know what they've seen um, in years past. So I want to defer that to Charles. Yeah, th thanks Alec. Um, so, uh, and thank you for the question. It's, it's a good one. Um, I, I will start uh, sort of with um, the importance of choosing uh, the proper root stock. And I don't know if you have an existing orchard or what, but um, we, we have decided to plant all of our trees on a root stock called MM111. And, and it's, a, it's a full size root stock. Um, um, but we're, we're dwarfing the trees based on how we're planting them sort of in a high density um, British hedgerow style. But the reason why I bring that up is it's, a, it's, it's quite a um, resilient rootstock, it, both uh, virus and, and drought resistant rootstock, which is critical in, in the Northeast and, and our climate zone. Um, we have just about every single pest and virus that you could ever imagine in New Jersey um, and it's getting worse. We're seeing certain apple bores that, um, that have never been this far north, um, you know, uh, in, in, in the last couple of years. Um, so we're, we're dealing with pests all the time. Um, same thing with virus. I mean, you know, powder the mildew and, and cedar apple rust and, and you name it, we get it in New Jersey. Um, for us, because we are growing our apples for our hard cider, um, we're fine with a lot of blemishes um, uh, that maybe eating apple orchards would not be fine with. So we're very limited in our spray program, um, but we do use um, a different series of sprays, obviously all organic and, and um, 
and very limited. But to answer your question on um, the specifics of, of our trees being part of this permaculture approach, we've absolutely seen the benefits um, um, of the trees by having proper cover cropping, um, having, um, you know, so dealing with weed management through our cover cropping as opposed to um, sprays. Um, Alec talked about surround. I mean, that, you know, applying surround helps keep our trees um, sort of dormant longer in the winter so that they don't bloom too early in a, in a kind of spring where we have frost like we did this year. So there's a lot of things that we're using it under our sort of regenerative approach that that make our trees resilient but um we've been grappling with a lot of disease um and that's again back all the way to the, my point about uh, ripping the trees out um after three years was because they were pretty not healthy but that's when they were in a very very monoculture approach and i think our trees are much more stable and resilient right now um, because of the nutrients in the soil because of the integration with the rest of the farm Thank you. Um, you had mentioned Michael Phillips as one of your advisors. Are you using his protocols, or um, not? Not a not, not much because Michael's a very small scale grower, and um, you know we're massive fans and outrageously respectful. Um, but but his his stuff his protocols aren't really sort of viable for an orchard our size. Um, we worked with AEA, which is uh, John Kemp's company, Advancing Eco Agriculture, um, for a lot of our um, um, sprays and amendments. Um, but also we have a consultant in upstate New York, Mike Bilitonin, um, who's, uh, you know, up in the Finger Lakes region and, and sort of, he seems to be the guy who has had the most success in trying to scale up what Michael does. Can you talk a little bit about the the cover crops that for the in association with the fruit trees? Yeah, I mean we we've sort of um, we have sort of different areas of of uh, we, we've tried different things in different zones um, because we have different planting structures throughout the the farms. Um, I would say that the most important part of the cover copying conversation is what we did in the two, almost three years um, between ripping out the, 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 um, the, uh, the trees and then replanting this past spring. Um, and so that was a four or five plant uh, planting regime over the seasons. Uh, everything from buckwheat to sorghum to different clovers, um, adding, you know, uh, trying to get as much nitrogen in the soil as possible, um, sort of squeezing out a lot of the invasives. Um, so that was, you know, we would we would go through those, um, you know, uh, seasonally. We would we would change those crops through. Um, I don't know if a lot of our other. Alec, I don't know if you wanted to add yeah. any. Well, other so just on right the now. the regimen that these guys went through before we just replanted um, five thousand trees this past spring and set up our permanent silo pasture layout was that the field was pretty much a monoculture of mugwort and thistle. So, and there were some issues that they wanted like fum uh, biological fumigants in the soil, like mustards and rapeseed and all that sort of stuff. Um, but out competing. Um, the mugwort and thistle was, I think, the primary objective while adding organic matter to the soil. So there is a two full seasons of real intensive tillage where there was, um, a, well, starting in the fall, so a fall for a winter cover, followed by a mid to late April planting of a quick spring plant uh, uh, cover like buckwheat. Then followed by, and then so they, these guys, this was before I came to this property. Um, so they hired a guy uh, that had a big, like 200 horsepower tractor down the street that just disked the property. So we weren't doing any plowing, uh, but it was a disking that was going about eight to 10 inches deep, um, followed by a harrow to level it out um, after that. Um, so the, idea was that to just have a really strong uh, cover established to smother out the thistle and the mugwort. 
Um, and then you would come back in, turn that cover crop in. And in doing that, you're cutting all of the roots of the mugwort and the thistle that would otherwise just be re-sprouting and multiplying and then doing another quick planting. And then what, and the goal was for two years to keep the cover crop, the canopy, and then just run these invasives out of energy. Um, and I've been on this property for years before I was working here full time. And I've not, I, the amount of mugwort, I mean, I don't have the exact scientific data of like what the reduction was per square inch or anything, but just from a visual observation of the property, I'd say there's less than 5% mugwort um, yeah. any of the 65 acres um, that make up that whole zone on the property. Um, so from an anti-tillage perspective, or I mean, the, the jury's out on the, 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 the bad sides of all that tillage that was happening, um, the plus side from, I mean, there's not a single place on this property that has less than 8% organic matter. Um, so, and from what I've heard from the previous farmers before this, there's rating between one and a half to 4% organic matter. So um, I think we are increasing um, yeah. that from all of the plant material that was being incorporated into the soil. And we removed all these weeds that would be very problematic for um, the pastures with livestock as well as annuals. So um, for, from the perspective of what we needed to happen for the property, um, it worked out really well for us. And Folks, I, don't know, and yeah, I don't know if Johan by chance has anything else to add with that, if Johan's still on the call, but um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if, if everything was said there, but that seems to. Yeah, you know. no, that that's a great summary of that from, from Alec and I'm startled that I didn't realize your organic matter content was that high. So yeah, but, yeah, it's very high. That's great feedback from, from both of you guys. And I know it's been an ongoing both conversation before and after that whole process started. So it's just good to hear that feedback. We uh, we're getting close to the end of our time. So I just want to be sure that folks get their questions in. Please feel free to shout one out. So I, I had a question for Alec on the, um, when you're using the key line plow and you talked about using that as a, almost a primary um, tillage and cultivation. Um, so I get it from the no-till perspective, you're not inverting the soil. So mm -hmm. there's the bonus there. You're getting the irrigation bonus of pulling that water through the landscape on contour. Are you, and have you had enough experience yet with this, but are you then offsetting from a year to year where those um, subsoiler rips are going or are you just kind of deepening each um, um, well, I've only had one season where I was running that on this property, mm -hmm. um, but the plan would be, so all, well, how we do it, if we decide to do it in the actual pasture, I mean, that's something that I guess you and I will be discussing at another time. Um, but as far as in the annual crop areas, um, it most likely be running in the same spot because all of the blocks are set up with the same uh, wheel and tractor centers. Um, so I would be run. I, I don't like all the fields and blocks are set up how they're going to be in their permanence. Um, so I, I want any compaction that's happening from tractors to stay in the same spot and not be moving the left or the right or uphill or downhill as time goes on. Um, However, when I'm running that plow, there's a shank behind uh, each set of tires. So it is loosening up any compaction that was done um, immediately as it's driving forward. Thanks, thanks. Did we mention we have rocks? <laughs> hey, hey, Alec, I wanted to just ask you to talk a little bit about um, where you got some of this training and experience that must be critical for you to be able to take on a project like this and think about managing all these people and different systems and whatnot. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Um, willing to fail every single day and make mistakes <laughs> and learn from them. <laughs> that YouTube, <laughs> really good mentors. 
Um, and just honestly, the greater, I mean, I, NOFA has been something that I've known about since I took my first ecology class with Joe Heckman and at Rutgers 14 years ago. So, um, and then also, I mean, I, I could probably put the, yeah, thank Joe Heckman for the majority of it because he also, in that first class I took with him at Rutgers, we went to Rodale on a field trip and that's how I found out about Rodale and have been following them and going to their field days for years. Um, when I was in college, I took a permaculture course with uh, Andrew Faust up in Ellenville, New York. Um, so that was, I think, my first um, like aha moment of understanding like um, the integration of ecological systems and uh, how you can model uh, community and life and philosophy and everything off of natural systems that the earth is doing on its own. Um, I, when I was in college, I lived on a kibbutz in Israel for a few months. Um, that was a community that was founded 70 years before Israel was a state. And it was just a bunch of people that picked a valley and that was swampland and figured out how to drain the swamp into ponds and then birds showed up and then birds brought fish and then they had fish. And then, so, um, so that was big inspiration for me, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, also, I, I declared I was going to be a chef when I was three years old and I've been working in the food industry since I was 14 and paid my way through college working in some of the highest end restaurants in New Jersey and, um, had, so from like the management of people, I think that, well, one, I never in a million years thought I'd be a manager. It just kind of happened. It wasn't anything that was planned out, but from working in restaurants and like, I can't think of any other job that's more about working as a team and that you're only as strong as the weakest link. Like I came to all those realizations at a young age working in a restaurant. Um, so the whole mindset of how that culture works is can be brought into any other sector of work, so a farm or, or any other business. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm kind of just rambling right now. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I minored in agriculture ecology at Rutgers, took some courses and I've just been grateful for a really amazing farming community in New Jersey and lots of good farming friends and people that are willing to share their mistakes and successes and just learning as you're going. So, and I, I don't think that, I mean, farming is such a humbling thing for everyone that, I mean, no one, I mean, the oldest farmer is still, you speak to these guys that are 70, 80 years old. They, they still have no idea. I mean, I like the analogy that like, if I'm going to grow potatoes and try to figure out potatoes and I farm for 40 years, I've only got to try growing potatoes 40 times. If I'm trying to learn a new song on a guitar, I could practice that song 40 times in 30 minutes. So it's a, it's a lifelong commitment to figuring it out and willing to learn from your mistakes and other people's mistakes. So um, I don't know, that's how I see it. Well, you guys have really given us a really great presentation tonight. And um, I'm sure everybody really wants to thank you for that. If we could all clap for you and have you hear it. Um, <laughs> Alec, I, I would also like to add that we at NOFA are extremely grateful for your years of service on our board, especially when you were so occupied and busy building your various farms and that you brought an incredible mix of expertise and, and wisdom about the food system to all of our discussions. And thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Guys, I wanna remind you the winter conference this year for NOFA is gonna be uh, virtual. It looks like we've got some really great lineups coming, uh, not least of which will be the end of the conference where we'll be doing a journey person round table and hopefully at that point really launching um, you know sort of a clear guide to how to find videos like this that was recorded and will be on NOFA's YouTube channel so that you could view it 
later or share it with a friend who you think might be interested in it. Um, also connecting to other sort of educational resources. Um, and speaking of educational resources, I just want to remind you too that Caro shared us a, a short little link in the chat. Um, they're looking, or Caro is uh, trying to promote the topic of farmers who are interested in minimal tillage, uh, trying to figure out you know, how, what policies and programs we want to support. So I encourage you to click on that link and just do a quick uh, answer the survey. We'll try to hold this, this Zoom open for a couple minutes more. So once we wrap up, you can, you can click on that. I'll also post it at northslopefarm.com on our homepage. So if you want to do it tomorrow, look after 10 o'clock and it should be up there. Any last questions, folks? Otherwise, I think we'll uh, say thank you to Alec and Charles and wrap it up for the evening. I think I think that's a resounding thank you guys and uh, we'll see you we'll see you out there